having a session 14, breakout session 14. We're going to talk about innovation tools. We're going to talk about drones. We're going to talk about urban freight. Uh, my name is Buthena Gurmazi. I'm the director for regional integration. I cover Africa and MENA. And it is my privilege uh, to be having this discussion today with a very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of freight transport in the context of a very rapid urbanization, the importance of tackling issues around decarbonization, uh, the importance of technology and how technology can get us to where we need to get. Um, so I'm delighted to, to be having the discussion today. And let me introduce the panelists. Um, so we have with us uh, Ms. Karen Van Klusien. Karen, yes, you're right there. Uh, so uh, Karen is Secretary General of Police Network. Uh, Police is the leading European network of cities and regions on urban transport innovation and working to develop and deploy sustainable and innovative urban mobility solutions for the cities of today and tomorrow. We're happy, happy to have you with us. Uh, the second panelist is Stephanie Kodish. Stephanie is uh, the Senior Global Director of Drive to Zero, uh, CalStart, and Drive to Zero is working to accelerate the carbonization of commercial vehicles uh, through, uh, through global partnership, uh, through knowledge, uh, through innovative tools, uh, groundbreaking uh, research. Somebody's trying to... You got a video? Oh, no, she's not talking. <laughs> very, very good. And uh, Stephanie is um, an experienced uh, lawyer and leader in environmental and social justice laws and policies. So we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, we have uh, with us today Mr. Uh, Zhao Chilu. Director, uh, Deputy Director of China Electric Vehicle 100, and uh, with multiple, multiple years of rich experience in uh, several industries. And today he's going to talk to us about the intelligence connected vehicle industry. We're very delighted to have you with us. Uh, we have Ms. Eloisa Reyes, head of uh, Global Strategic Partnerships at uh, Speedbird IORO. And uh, when we talk about Speedbird, we talk about the seamless drone logistics platforms uh, unlocking the potential of the sky. I got this from your website and I love it. Uh, and uh, yes, so we're going to be excited to hear more about, uh, about drones, about speed, uh, Speedbird uh, in the discussion. And last but not least, we have Christina Albuquerque, and uh, she's a director for Global Electric Mobility at uh, WRI, our co-host for PT24. Uh, and we're going to hear uh, a lot uh, from you, Christina, on the trends and uh, also your experience uh, as senior urban mobility manager for WRI uh, Brazil, I think, will come in very handy in this discussion. So let us uh, get started uh, on the discussion. So we know uh, the importance of urbanization. This is maybe one of the defining um, factors of our lives. Uh, the urbanization is moving very, very fast uh, at an unprecedented speed. And of course, uh, with that, uh, there is a lot of expectation on urban transportation and urban freight. So. Um, also, uh, if we get it right, I think we get uh, healthy, uh, sustainable uh, environments that are very important. And all of this is very important to economic development. So you see the excitement around uh, urban freight when it comes to any discussion around development. And there is a lot of thinking today about uh, the, the topic. Uh, there is a lot of strategies being built. Uh, so we're going to start the discussion by actually asking uh, Karen to tell us, uh, you know, from, from your experience and working closely with the, uh, you know, EU um, and European um how, how, what is being shaped up in terms of strategies? What's the latest in mm -hmm. on the topic? Um, 
Thank you for having me and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So looking at the EU policy context, we see that there's a lot of EU legislation that's actually pushing for zero emission city logistics. Just to give you a couple of examples, there's a revision of the air quality directive, which is now setting more stringent even air pollution limits, which are aligned with the WHO recommendations. There's a revision of CO2 standards for cars and vans. So there will be a ban on sales of new internal combustion and internal combustion engine cars and vans from 2035. There's the um, infrastructure uh, rollout uh, of, of charging infrastructure for alternative fuels, which is uh, setting clear targets in terms of the number of charging points that need to be made available by certain uh, moments in time. And there's also uh, a regulation around urban nodes in the trans-European transport network, work that cities and regions can work with. And of course, it needs to happen in close partnership with the industry because urban freight is very much um, a context where we need to have that uh, joined up thinking and cooperation. And that's also why Polis as a network of cities and regions has entered into a partnership with another platform, which is called Alice. And they are bringing the logistics um, sector around the table with our cities and regions. And together we have identified what the main intervention areas should be to move towards emission-free, safer, and more efficient urban freight transport. And let me just quickly highlight the five intervention areas that we have identified together, smart governance and regulations. So a very important tool in that context in Europe is the development of sustainable urban logistics plans to have an integrated urban freight policy in partnership with the industry. But another important governance tool is, for example, the zero emission zones for urban freight as well. So access regulations, which would only allow uh, zero emission urban freight vehicles to enter certain areas in, in cities. And for that, we've also developed a guide in partnership with the Transport Decarbonization Alliance, showing how cities can roll out such um, zones. A second intervention area, clean vehicles and um, uh, energy infrastructure. And there, the focus is very much on electrification, but also on smaller electric vehicles. So light electric vehicles that are more fit for an urban context. And there, of course, cities also have a responsibility in providing charging infrastructure um, that is sufficiently meeting the needs. <clears throat> Third intervention area, logistics operations, and that's measures such as consolidation centers, multimodal hubs, parcel lockers, but also supporting retail, for example, in competing with uh, the explosion of e-commerce, which is uh, an important factor over the last couple of years, data sharing and data acquisition between the public and the private sector, uh, which also will help us to more dynamically manage the curbside, for example, and allocate different functions to the curbside, including deliveries, depending on the needs of a particular moment in time. And finally, last intervention area, consumer engagement. We need to raise awareness also with the consumers, make them aware of the choices and the implications of the choices they make when it comes to deliveries and, and help them make more sustainable choices as well and move away from this instant delivery now and in whatever way, you know. And that's what we are working on in partnership with the industry. That I think we're all guilty of the last uh, of the last point you mentioned. Uh, great, thank you, thank you for for sharing with us. And you know the five areas are great, uh, very clear. And you mentioned the importance of the collaboration between the public and the private, and yeah, you know the 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 customer being also you know understanding uh, all the challenges. I'm going to go to you, Christina, uh, to tell us what's the latest. <laughs> Uh, in the topic and in the thinking uh, of from where you sit. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. A pleasure to be here with this panel. So I will start saying some numbers that's really aligned with what Karin was just saying, that we have uh, the the trends that freight is going to triple by 2050, the needs that we're going to have, and the CO2 is more than double that we have right now. And looking for the delivery itself, looking for inside freight, so deliveries, if you look for the top 10, uh, top 100 cities in the world, the that we increase by 36% the demand of delivery in our cities by 2030. Uh, and this is going to lead for rising congestions by 21% in these cities. And the emissions is going to increase by 32%. 
So we really need to be working in these regulations that, uh, as Karin was saying, but also looking for this consumer uh, engagement. I really like the way you put it, that because it's really what we are seeing the need for now aligning with that. Uh, I can mention some works that we have been doing also as WRI in some cities that's uh, really aligned also as Karin was bringing for the European perspectives, working in zero emission zones in a lot of cities that can help to to the market to go in this direction, helping the city uh, level policy and the regulations to bring all the charging infrastructure needed, but also working how the grids can support this transition, but helping uh, the market and the companies to accelerate the way to be in a zero emission freight uh, step in the next years for now and really uh, having the best impact for citizens in our cities we're working with. We are also seeing the need for coalitions to accelerate this transition. So I'm not going to talk for China work we are doing because Mr. Lee is going to is going to talk a lot a lot about that. But I can mention some other things that we are seeing in the way. So companies are starting to make a lot of commitments from the private sector, and they need to be supported by the regulations in the cities with the charge infrastructure, but also from the market perspectives, creating new types of vehicles that can allow a better uh, operation in city centers that are not so big and the regulation in support also and accelerate these transitions with restrictions when they can circulate, but where they can um, drop off zones and all those things. And one really good coalition that we are seeing, but I'm not going into the details because I think Stephanie is also going to bring that, is in India, that the Indian government have a lot of uh, the the mandate to decarbonize the fleet and they're working with the EFAS platform that is working with a lot of different organizations, WRI is being one of them, but a lot of others, Cow Start uh, and some others working on how the environment need to be ready to allow the transition for a zero emission freight in cities, but also outside of cities, but I'm going to concentrate in the cities, looking for some pillars for this transition, that being the infrastructure, so the charging infrastructure, how they need to be uh, deployed in cities in an efficient way that can support the different companies and the different use for this infrastructure to allow to be zero emissions and also unlock it in the financial mechanisms to making sure we are going to have a sustainable and affordable transition that's not going to increase a lot of the costs for the supply chain for the delivery services around uh, the those industries. So this is more or less what we are seeing right now, but I have to go into the details. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. And the numbers you shared in the beginning are really telling about how you know serious is the situation and how we really need to to think about it uh, and you know double the the actions uh, there and you also made my job easier because as you, as you were talking you you mentioned that Stephanie will talk to us about India uh, so if you can share with us and then I'll go to you Mr uh, Leo to talk to us about China thank you um, and I, I want to maybe start by just um, underscoring two things, the cleverness of the title that I'm sure attracted all of you to join this panel, um, but also to express gratitude for taking part in this conversation. Um, I think that there, there's something I really want to lift up that Christina mentioned because it speaks to the outsized effect Hello. of commercial vehicles on emissions, in particular uh, affecting human health and climate in cities, but also importantly, presenting significant opportunities and sustainable jobs and economic benefit, which are areas that we need to be, I think, speaking more about and more precisely. Um, so I want to jump in to um, highlight a couple of examples, um, but before I do, I, I do want to just mention um, that Drive to Zero, um, in, in concert with the Dutch government, we co-lead the Global Memorandum of Understanding on zero emission, medium and heavy duty vehicles. This sets the global standard for decarbonizing medium and heavy duty such that 30% of new vehicle sales by 2030 have commitment to be decarbonized and 100% by 2040. This MOU has the support of 33 governments and over 130 endorsers, including 
subnational governments, which implicate cities as well as provinces, as well as utilities and OEMs. And so it's really that kind of holistic thinking that I want to sort of now pull down to talk about a couple of examples and maybe just starting with the one on India, which is just a remarkable uh, manifestation of the way aligned partners with clear vision and ambition can accelerate transition. Um, if you've been here for any moments, there's no way you've not heard about the PSM effort, which is the work but between the U.S. government and partners, including philanthropy government um, to unlock $10 billion, and that's in support of 38,000 uh, buses in order to transition rapidly. So this is a unique finance model that can be used and is being used across the but that can also um, be the kind of innovative finance tool that cities can use. And cities are fascinating spaces because of the rich, innovative opportunities. So I wanna just jump in on three particular examples. Um, one is with regard to the, the sort of phasing in approach. There's an ease in getting overwhelmed quite quickly when you think about all of the things that you need to do and you want to do them now. But one particular example that I will lift up is from LA in California, where there's a 2030 goal to have a zero emission city. But in the interim, what they've done is established five areas of zero emission loading commercial vehicle areas. Yeah. So it's not, a, it's not a ton, right? It's not significant, but this was launched in 2021. And what it does is has the effect of accelerating commercial vehicles with a ripple effect in order to comply with those city requirements. The second thing I'll talk about is the innovation that's come from Kavita, India, which is in Gujarat. And it's a really unique example of a small city that's decided to designate the area as an electric vehicle only zone. So thinking innovatively, not in terms of necessarily magnitude and scale at the outset, but also what are the different ways of thinking and innovating and how we approach in order to pull these different partnerships together. The third example that I'll mention is the anchoring concept, which is something uh, magnificent, and you may have heard a bit about this already in Quito, Ecuador. So this is a UNESCO designated World Heritage Site, and they have said we are going to be limiting entry based on time now and day and in order to drive down emissions of co2 and nox this improves public health as well as drives down climate emissions but this is another way where you're instead centering a place that you're trying to protect that has significant draw for tourism but then you're also elevating another rich example for how you can go about transitioning fleets so i'll pause there uh, and look forward to the discussion thank you thank you so much an amazing example from different parts of the world. Thank you so much. So we're going to go uh, to um, Zhao Chi for you. And you've been uh, playing a key role in shaping, I think, the e-mobility program in China through your advisory role to, uh, to uh, you know, many uh, policymakers, I think. So what can you tell us about the China experience on this uh, sector? Okay. And uh, we, uh, in China, we have... Uh, uh, put the zero emission free zone is a very important program, and uh, so far because we the penetration rate for uh, sh the cargo uh, uh, new energy truck only percentage of ten percent penetration rate still below the passenger cars which is thirty five percent, and but uh, we have the new programs uh, started this year. We've seen 15 cities started with public transportation electrification programs. By year 2025, we will be reach 80% electrification of the transportation area. So that that's uh, uh, one of the programs. The second, I just mentioned by Christine about Shenzhen. Shenzhen is the best. I think it's best in the world. It takes the most uh, uh, zero emission uh, free truck. Yeah. More than one hundred thousand of them, and uh, it started with early stage. You know, the first one, yeah, top top ten city of green, yeah, and zero emission zone worldwide. <laughs> and uh, also, we have think about the private sector very important play their roles. And we have uh, like Shenzhen city has a uh, 
uh, they had partners of the uh, logistic companies, master uh, cargoes and uh, charging facilities are working together to make the rules. For example, the, where is this, the zero emission rule set up? Which, where is it should be in the com- city center or commercial center or resident center, not in the, but not in the port, uh, uh, port nor uh, lo- uh, logistic center. So that's what we be looking for. And also has well, the, the government has working city government, uh, government working with uh, renting companies to, re- to reduce the barrier of the entry the uh, electric vehicle, not such as ninety five percent of Shenzhen's truck going to, is electric truck by rent, and uh, government subsidy of uh, twenty five hundred to seven thousand RMB per month the subsidy of those. Because they think this is a public public benefit for the low carbon dioxide pollution, so that's uh, uh, one of the program. I also have the, the setups uh, called uh, the district uh, distribution center, which is uh, has uh, make the common delivery outside the green or zero emission zone, and uh, has accepted some. Uh, tractors and use uh, more efficient uh, methodologies. That's the Shenzhen's experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it always starts with a clear strategy and a clear plan and collaboration between the public and the private. And, you know, financing is important, sometimes even subsidies. So great, great, uh, great example there. So, um, so far we've heard a lot uh, on, on, on the strategy and the approach and the issue around technologies front and center. So I'm gonna turn to you now, Lois, uh, to talk to us about, uh, you know, um, drones and how can drones be part of a, a big solution to the problem of uh, uh, urban freight? Well, first of all, thank you everybody. Thank you for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. and. Um, that's right, Speedbird is um, a, a company that focuses on drone delivery, medium to light cargo deliveries. Um, and I just want to give you also um, a little bit of data to lay the path into what I'm going to say. Um, the, it, the drone delivery market is an emerging market, and 80% of it is um, towards enterprises and 20 is recreation. Um, In 2030, it's gonna scale to almost 55 um, billion US dollars. And I'm gonna offer you also some data in Brazil. Brazil is an aviation country. Uh, Brazil has ANAC. ANAC, uh, along with the FAA and the IASA, is one of the three main aviation agencies in the world. ANAC is also a member of ICAO. And um, ANAC certifies Embraer's airplanes, and the same people that sign off on those airplanes sign off on our drone. Um, Brazil loses 4% of its GDP in traffic. Um, Brazil has 20,000 deaths yearly and um, are caused in motorcycle accidents. 75% of the cargo is uh, delivered by ground versus 5.8 that um, is delivered by air. So now let me share a little bit of Speedbird. Speedbird is a one-stop shop um, company. We are an OEM. We, we um, made our own drones, we certified them, we made the software that they used to fly, and we have the certification, and we also operate. Um, the way that we see this is that the drone is a complement in the mobility uh, chain. And um, the drone, um, what we're proposing is that the drone takes care of 80 to 90% of the total travel distance 
and the other 10% it's um, done with another green uh, model as well. Um, we generate local jobs and we're not replacing um, the jobs. We are actually integrating ourselves in, as I said, in this mobility chain. Um, and we have a very pragmatic approach. We don't say that we're gonna deliver in people's homes. Um, we, what we do is the capitalization of the cities. We try to get as close as we can to the final client, the final consumer. And um, this has a lot of use, especially in emergencies and in regions with difficult access. Um, our drones, we have uh, three models and our drones have 150 redundancies, safety redundancies, and they have a parachute. And um, I wanna dive into the health market. We have a very strong partnership with Hermes Pardini. It's one of the biggest labs in Brazil. What do we do with them? Um, Recently, last month, we got the certificate to fly category B, which is um, dangerous materials. This is known by UN3373, for those who want to look a little bit more into it. Um, we, are, we were transporting before this biological materials, um, non-contaminant. And now we're gonna be able to start transporting um, hazardous materials like tuberculosis tests, and of course, continue transporting organs, medicines, vaccines, and any surgical materials that are needed. The packing has to be approved by the ANAC. ANAC is like the FAA, as I mentioned. Um, so we have to guarantee that if we run into an accident, the what is inside when we're transporting is not going to spill. So that's very important. It's something that we develop as well. Um, and I'm going to offer you here some data. Um, Brazil is, is a, a big country, almost as big as the U.S. And Pardini has 8,000 collection points in, 2, 000, in over 2,000 cities. So they use... 390, um, they have 380 routes and they use 250 vehicles and 140 motorcycles. They go two point trips around the globe every day. So you can imagine um, all the, the fuel emissions, right? And the carbon footprint that they are, they're living. So what we are doing is that we're using a green model, our drone. To, to help with this. So um, they have also, uh, the, the, one of the benefits is of using the drone is the reduction of time, the reduction of cost, and um, reducing, of course, the, the carbon footprint. The cargo, um, as I said, it's been delivered in places like Salvador, uh, Belo Horizonte, Ilha Vela, in the state of Pará, in the Amazon, um, and in the city of Santa Catarina. We have also a partnership with Fio Cruz and um, Saving in Brasilia. Um, should I, should I One minute. <laughs> continue? I'll save it for later. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And great, great uh, example. And uh, I think a, a good model for, you know, many other countries to, to, to build on. So thank you for, for that. So I want to stay more on the issue around, you know, technology. And we heard from the different participants that the technology is there and, uh, you know, we know how to do it. Uh, and yet it's not very easy. Uh, so I want you to share with us, you know, what do you see as challenges for, you know, countries to incorporate the technology uh, into, you know, uh, what they do? Uh, so maybe, Christina, you can you can start on this. Yeah, thank you. 
So yeah, we are still having a lot of challenges. And I think one of them that uh, a lot of the private companies are taking the lead a little bit on that is the financial mechanisms to really make sure that we scale the fleets that we have around the cities to be zero emissions. But it's happening and we are seeing we are going this direction. But a lot of the places we are still lacking the, the alignment between the policies and the private companies that are willing to do those uh, those improvements in their fleets. And when I'm uh, mentioning policies, also looking for the infrastructure for charging those vehicles. So it's part of the cost. So if one of the companies need to have their own structure and they were not sharing the infrastructure and grid improvement needed for renewable energies, the costs in total are much higher. So how we can help policymakers to have aligned policies that can help and coordinate these efforts so we can, uh, uh, we can rely on one infrastructure that can support the different companies aligned with policy restrictions for parking, for the river in time, for top of vehicles on the cities that can accelerate and foster that. So the barriers, I think, is this alignment that also Karen mentioned as one of the pillars, the governance and the regulation parts that need to be more aligned with private sector companies' uh, targets. And uh, for me, one of the, the main piece of that is bringing also the charging infrastructure as a big component for the discussion so we can rely on a network shared in city centers for accelerate the transition. Excellent. We're going to stay with the same idea around challenges. And I'm going to ask you, Mr. Liu, to, to tell us what's, what's, what are the challenges for us to really get to a point where it's not a problem anymore? Uh, actually, I, I think there are a couple of questions. Uh, it's very about challenges. And the uh, first one is the uh, policies. And the uh, co commercial vehicle uh, electrification is heavily relying on policy guidance, and uh, especially some road right. I think in China, road right is more important than a commercial subsidy. And uh, some city has more policy support for road right, some system less. That's material impact uh, publication, you know, utilization of the electric vehicles. So that's a uh, uh, first uh, object challenges. And uh, Second one is that uh, cost, TOC, total cost of ownership. So it's a very important issue before the commercial vehicle sector because uh, nothing else just cost compared with SEV. Most of the electric vehicle has higher cost. And so that's quite not easy for the freight industry to accept that. And the uh, third one, the performance of the electric vehicle, first, especially for the logistic vehicles, because overweight of the yes. battery, which reduce the loading capacity, weight, space, mileage, that uh, makes disadvantages. So the third one, the first one is that uh, charging, the longer charging time reduce performance and the economics. And the uh, fifth one, technology. There's a multiple route of technology. There's a BEV, hybrid, relay, hydrogen fuel, hydrogen ICV, methanol. Multiple overlation of the technology so, makes the complication, make application complicated. This wasn't connected. Sixth one, the regional difference in China. Metropolitan cities has a much higher application rate. The top five cities of in China has to almost take fifty percent ownership for the uh, electrical free trade. And uh, that's our challenge. And uh, we're talking about uh, opportunity. Okay. And first, the multiple technology makes the multiple uh, choices. They, they are can complement each other and uh, to exit the combination of commercial vehicle, or such as BV is good for long, shorter distance, such as 200 kilometers below. It's special for city, uh, public city, uh, public transportation, sanitation, light city distribution, light truck distribution, 
hydrogen fuel vehicle is for 300 km a lot and above for heavy duty trucks for long distance for mixed uh, for hybrid is, is suitable for some complicated situation and for suburbs long distance so that we, we we think about that and also has and uh, opportunities like the cooperation among cities department entities promote a cooperation development such as environmental department required clean transportation equipment set up the zero emission zoo transportation transportation department provide the road ride right and the registration benefit industry department can set up the new electric vehicle development target the third one is commercial model commercial model can fit in the gap of technology cost the market demand and with reshape the industry's ecology the value chain restructure can expand the, the industry chain or value chain and the uh, the, the vehicle will plus components, energy, finance, data, information services, all the other factors together. So that's what we, what we are doing now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it is clearly, uh, you know, a complex set of things that need to happen at the same time between the technology and the cost. And so, uh, yes, Karen. What, what what do you see as the challenges? There are many, and I agree with the ones that have been mentioned uh, already, so I won't repeat them, but maybe add some more. <laughs> um, what I think is also important when we talk about urban freight is to realize that we're not, ju not just talking about the need to decarbonize. There are actually a multitude of negative externalities linked to urban freight transport that cities need to address. So we need an integrated approach as well that ideally ticks several boxes. We need to decarbonize, but we also need to tackle air and noise pollution. We need to deal with the road safety challenges linked to big vehicles. We need to deal with congestion, the lack of efficiency as well, uh, the lack of consolidation, the conflicting claims on urban space. Another challenge that makes things even more complicated in this field is that we need uh, a multitude of stakeholders to come together whose interests are not necessarily or at least not automatically aligned. There's public sector versus private sector, but also the competition between different private sector players. Uh, they do not necessarily want to be one happy family working towards the same goal. Um, the digital divide as well between the public and the private sector. Uh, we see that the skills to capitalize on data and to use that data for more data-driven and evidence-based decision-making, that those skills are still lacking in many public uh, authorities and we need to build um, that capacity. Also, there are many solutions, as you mentioned. Um, so the technology is out there, but how do we scale it? That's still a challenge as well, uh, because sometimes the business model is not obvious. Um, when we talk about consolidation, consolidation centers, for example, uh, we see that in the end, it's very often the public sector that needs to support um, such consolidation approaches, because otherwise the business case is simply not there. But also in terms of scaling, I think what is really important in terms of making sure that solutions don't get stuck in the piloting phase and then die and there's no legacy is that we invest in replication and that's what in Europe is being done also through all kinds of European research and innovation projects where we pilot new solutions but also invest in replication of those solutions once we've seen they're successful in one context that we try to transfer them to other contexts and let me just name one particular project which I think is very interesting uh, called Solutions Plus which is not just staying within the EU uh, ecosystem system but is also reaching out to other regions of the world and so there's they have piloted a number of solutions in in terms of urban freight electrification in particular and then uh, invested a lot in replicating those solutions with small portions of funding in other cities uh, in latin america in africa um, and and so on and and we try to bring the whole ecosystem together local production of vehicles uh, involving the different stakeholders um, recommendations on how to upscale 
scale and finance the new solutions, but also social inclusion and empowerment. Um, just highlighting a couple of very nice initiatives, which don't necessarily mean uh, a lot of investment, but really can empower um, local stakeholders. For example, in, in Kenya, in Togo, in, in Kisi town in Lome, where uh, they procured e-trikes that were locally produced and um, provided to local women entrepreneurs, helping them to create their business and to and to really also make use of these clean vehicles for uh, local delivery. Similar uh, initiative also in Nairobi, where women were supported to um, to make use of electric motorcycles for food and grocery deliveries and to grow a, a local business like that. In Uganda, we had motorcycle uh, taxis and delivery drivers also, including this gender dimension. So starting on a very small scale, but by bringing the whole ecosystem together, increasing the chances of a legacy beyond the pilot. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this, in a way, you know, I think applies to any innovation, right? So when there's something new and we're all excited about the pilots, uh, but, you know, having in place the system to move beyond pilot into actual uh, scale and, you know, the idea of replication is, is great. And thanks for sharing the examples from many clients that we serve. So that's, uh, that's very good. Um, so uh, let me now go to uh, Eloisa. And if you can talk about what are, what are the challenges you see in, 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 you know, the drone business from certification? And I think you've touched on some of them, but if you can go deeper into the challenges. Sure, I think, um, thank you. The, the first main challenge will be certification, definitely, um, and regulation. Um, another challenge is how are we gonna have drone traffic um, in the air flying together with helicopter traffic and airplanes? Airplanes were not to worry about because they fly high, high above, um, but helicopters and, and drones together. I think that's that's a challenge. It's been a challenge um, for us to be able to have a route. We, um, we, we fly on fixed routes. We study them and then we get them approved and uh, they get put on the ch um, chart um the, the the air chart so um and we have helicopters coming into our routes and flying into our routes they are not used to the drones uh being in the air it's really new and um and uh recreational drones as i mentioned at the beginning of my conversation um are flying without aviation knowledge and what i would like all of you to to go home with, when we are talking about drones, we don't like to use our terminology, although we need to use it because that's what it sticks. Um, we want to call uh, our drones aircrafts. We prefer that word, that word because it's aviation. It's not, we're not talking about a 250 grams drones that a dad and a child are flying for, you know, for fun. No, we're trying about we're talking about drones that are carrying tons that are carrying a considerable amount of weight. So how are we gonna deconflict the airspace in order for us to be able to fly? Who has priority? Um, military, uh, uh, firemen, uh, police, and we all have to pause our operations. So all that deconfliction of the airspace is is one of the main challenges. Also, um, we, we need to share, if we're in the air, we need to share that we're flying so people can see us. And it's important that we're able to see others as well that are in the air. And it, it's, it's a challenge now. Uh, we know about airplanes, but we don't know about helicopters and drones. Very good. Yeah, and there is the whole discussion around the permitting and the certification and, you know, uh, yes, uh, amazing. Okay, so um, I'm going to go now to to you, uh, Stephanie, <laughs> and I, I want you to discuss, you know, how do you see the issues around, around challenges uh, 
And if you can, you know, zoom in on, on policy and regulation and the legal aspects, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of daunting, you know, like when you when you listen to the the whole set of challenges. But I think that, you know, part of the the way I think about this is that they present magnificent opportunities. Maybe the biggest challenge of all is that we're human and change is hard. Right. And so we gravitate towards what is known which has made it extraordinarily simple for the continued illusion that the fossil fuel industry is part of the future. And I think that is probably one of the biggest challenges that I would point to because there's a you know degree of, of misinformation and just moving things off topic and keen focus where I think collectively we all want and need to be. And so it's a bit of a distraction um, and it's not a factual uh, set of distractions. So um, what I would offer is maybe maybe pulling through some of the themes around opportunities that can be tethered in policy and regulatory spaces, but then also thinking all the way through about not waiting for a moment for things to come together and dictate what you and your space can do but act based on what you have. So there's a global ambition that I started talking about at the outset. So the global ambition in terms of commercial vehicles is clear, right? 30% by 2030, 100% by 2040. What does that mean? What that means is that now that you know a timeline, now you can begin to articulate the set of actors and the set of actor responsibilities. And that needs to be brought specifically into provisions of regulation. And of course, every country has, you know, somewhat of a different legal landscape. Some countries are far less used to having a letter of the law that is honored. But that's okay because it's a place to start. Because the main things you need to think about is what is the timeline that you are working on? Who are the actors that need to be involved? And how do you create the kind of structures where there can be genuine collaborative opportunities? So collaborative opportunities doesn't necessitate one partner telling another partner what to do. It necessitates a bit of giving and a bit of vulnerability to come into a space and confess what you don't know as an infrastructure provider that you do know as an OEM and what you don't know as an OEM that you need certainty from regulators within the government space to provide for you. Because certainty is everyone's friend. And the better and clearer that we can be earlier on, that we are all attuned and aligned with where it is that we are heading, then we we know the direction. There'll be bumps along the way. That's fine. It shouldn't slow or deter our path. Very good. Amazing and clear. Okay. So we have five minutes for, you know, questions. If you have questions to the panelists, please go ahead. Um, and then I'm going to ask each one of you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time <laughs> to, you know, as, as we know, transforming transportation is a, is a key platform where, you know, we uh, platform for sharing ideas and also reaching out to many clients who are, you know, dealing with these issues. So I want each one of you at the end after the Q&A to tell us what is one message you want, you know, people who are hearing you today to go home with and act on it. Um, and then meanwhile, we're gonna open it for five minutes questions. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Manzu Ravana. I'm with the World Bank. Uh, uh, my question is with the, uh, Eloisa. Uh, and I'd like to uh, know if you, were there any accidents or problem because you, you ex- express very good the collaboration with the helicopters, with military activities, with others. So oh, what is uh, the take on how, how many years you've been in the business for it? Thank you, sir. Um, Speedbird has been in the business since 2018. And um, any, any accidents, if there have been any accidents, um, no, 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 not, um, not now that we're flying commercially. We had accidents at the beginning, and I'm going to tell you when we had an accident is when our drones were flying with a remote control. That's when we had the accident because it was a human being beside the machine controlling the machine. And the human being can be distracted for a second. And then it was just like, oops, and the drone was already on the ground. So 
that being said, that gave you that gave us the um the the insight to do it autonomously. So all our drones now fly autonomously. It's a human being behind a screen um, with a pre-planned route, pre-approved route, um, pre-study of the land, pre-study of the takeoff and landing points, and all the training behind it. All our, we, we don't call them pilots, we call them operators, drone operators. And um, ANAC is the one that certified our training program. So we reduce accidents. And now what the industry is saying is that you are allowed to have one accident for every thousand flights that you do. So it's it's getting there. It's getting very solid. It's getting robust. But it's it's such a new thing. Like a few companies, and we count ourselves amongst them. We're flying. Uh, we've been flying for more than three years. But it's very very new. Good. Okay. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the panel. Um, oh, I'm uh, from the University of Toronto. Uh, so my question to whomever from the panel wants to take it is, regardless if we talk about drones or urban freight, at the end of the day, we're serving a demand that this demand is actually well more getting more and more savvy that we need things for tomorrow. So my question is, have you seen uh, some demand management strategies? So in the sense like uh, try to convince the people to consolidate uh, their cargo or what type of incentives you could go to the demand so then it's easier for the uh, carrier perspective. Thank you. Um, so I would, I would point to maybe two. Um, one is in the space of demand aggregation. And so looking across to identify like interests, to align them, and then when you have that alignment to accelerate. So that's precisely what's been done in India with buses um, to the tune of over 55,000 uh, and with trucks to nearly 8,000. Um, so really thinking across interests, but also defying geographies so that you are thinking about what are the use cases and how can you combine them? The other is around modal shift. And so I think the drone conversation is a really interesting one, but also when you're thinking about last mile delivery, when you're looking at giant uh, trucks that are not necessary and maybe it's a van or maybe it's a two or three wheeler, depending on the country context. Okay, okay. A comment to that. Okay, uh, and then we have one last question, so let's make it quickly, yes. Um, just in regards to what you just said, um, we have a few examples. Uh, we have an example uh, delivering food with iFood in Brazil. I, um, we have a video in case um, you guys want to share it. And we have another example with um, Ambev. Ambev owns three, uh, two thirds of the beer market globally. And um, why use a big truck? to deliver a six pack of beer when we can use a drone. Um, the drone can carry three six packs. So it's like, we are already, um, you know, sa saving um, saving uh, fossil fuel emissions. And um, so we have another example that I can give you also in things that we transport, um, swine semen, green area, uh, cl sorry, clean area to clean area. Um, we also are flying um, cell phones and SIM cards, so high value items. And in all of them, we are reducing a car carbon footprint. Uh, we also have a project with the favelas uh, in Brazil, um, same to reduce the carbon footprint. The only thing that we're waiting for is approval to be able to fly it above people. Excellent. So I'm sorry, I think we're going to cut the, the, the Q&A uh, session, but uh, you have the, the speakers here, so please, uh, you can follow up with them bilaterally. Uh, now I'm going to ask Almud to uh, close us off, and uh, I, I still want to have one minute at the end for the last message from the speakers. Almud. 
Okay, thank you very much. I did exactly what Femi, when she introduced us yesterday to the conference, say, you know, you're all scribbling madly. I was scribbling madly just to figure out what I'm actually going to say. Uh, it's not a summary because I, I think I learned a lot from everyone here on the panel. And what I find most exciting about this topic is really that it is such an innovative field. You no, know, for long decades in, in transport, um, we we had steady state on many things and there were some innovations, but I would say it was a niche area for niche people. And now we're center stage with so many innovations that are coming in that will so materially influence how we live in the future and how our cities are livable that it's very, very exciting. But but at the same time, it's very daunting if I, you know, um, when you asked our, our our friend from China to list challenges, it almost didn't stop the list, right? Uh, but, which is true. I mean, I think we need to just face that, right? With every innovation comes um, a lot of work as to how to make it work everywhere. So I think in the World Bank, we really, every time I hear about some innovation that coming from Latin America, I'm trying to figure out how this would work in Malawi or how this would work in Zambia. And, and, and I run into trouble right away. And I know our policymakers want this, but they are facing a mix of how do I go about it? They get confronted with a lot of people coming in wanting to do pilots. They don't know whether they should regulate them or not. Should we give the space? They don't know how to collaborate with the industry, figuring out how the policies and regulations should look like. Because frankly, most of the countries that are much more advanced are also struggling with that. So I think for us in the World Bank, the most important part is for us to really kind of stay engaged understand what's happening and try as much as possible to be a facilitator and mediator to bring that innovation that is happening in some of our countries into a space where it can grow, where it can expand and where it become mainstream. The last thing we want is all this innovation about, you know, 30 percent uh, zero emission trucks in, say, Western countries to dump all the bad trucks in in uh, in, a, in the continent that I'm currently working on. And that's a real risk right now. So for us to find a way of how we work with our clients um, across the whole globe, I think that's the most important um, work we can do. And, and I'm excited about it, scared a little bit, but also excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna pass the mic. Your last message to everyone. <laughs> Um, maybe two words, be in patience um, and don't lose hope. I, I don't think that we are saying any of us here that there's not reason for hope. We have the technology, we have the know-how, we know what it looks like, and now we need to do it and do it wisely in an inclusive way and quickly. This morning, uh, Mr. Vogel, um, so something that is stuck from his his talk was that we're building safe infrastructure. So in the case of a speedbird, we are building safe air infrastructure. We're working towards that every day. And um, thank you for having me here. Thank you. Um, cities hold many of the keys when it comes to decarbonizing uh, our transport sector and so they need to be empowered also by other levels of government to move forward and and what is important in this whole innovation context as well is that they set the right framework conditions so that we come to policy responsive innovation that helps us reach our policy goals but doesn't undermine it because that's something that you see happening sometimes as well with technology so it's about striking the right balance between allowing that innovation to thrive, but also making it policy responsive. Thank you. And I think it's very important to for carbon reduction combined with low cost logistics. And because without low cost of the logistics, it will be not sustainable. The second one is that cross-department collaboration and public-private cooperation is very important for urban freight, low carbon transportation system. Finally, compare with uh, resident uh, future uh, transportation, city logistics area have faced very huge difficulties. We are expected to cooperate with international cities institution to search for renovation solutions.
So I think my, my colleagues already gave a little bit the message I was looking for that it's feasible and it's possible, but we need a lot of work together with the different stakeholders in the way to make it uh, easier and really quick because we really need to accelerate the path to have zero emission freight in our cities. And we need everyone working together with a clear vision uh, between private sector, uh, stakeholders in the government in different levels, cities need to have more empowerment, the financial institutions, but working together to have the impact in to our cities and citizens uh, really soon. Very good, excellent. So thank you very much, everyone. And please join me in thanking our uh, panel for this afternoon. And I have to tell you, I've been in very few panels where the majority is clearly ladies. So please double <laughs> clap. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.